Hello, hello. Hi. Uh, let's maybe just wait for one more minute、uh, for more people to come in. Cool. That sounds good. And you can hear me, okay, Nina? Yes, I can. Okay. Sounds、brilliant. perfect. All right. That that spa music was extremely relaxing. I don't know. <laughs> I don't know if you have the energy for this. Yes. Yes. That was、uh, that was maybe we need something more energizing. Yeah, yeah, that was an interesting vibe. I don't know if you're expecting most people to be like very chilled <laughs> out during these educational talks, you know. Oh no. Okay, we will get to our today's discussion topic very quickly. So,、um, I guess I guess we can start now. It's time. So,、uh, hello everyone. Welcome to Binance Academy Live Webinar. I'm Nina Xiang, part of the Binance Academy team. Binance Academy's mission is to teach everyone about blockchain technology, and we're one of the largest learning hubs in the industry. So feel free to follow us on YouTube, Twitter, and other social media channels to stay tuned.、Uh, today, we're very happy to have Has、uh, Hasib、uh, Qureshi, managing partner of Dragonfly Capital, joining us. So Hasib,、uh, great to see you, and thank you for joining us today. Good to see you as well, Nina. Thanks for having me. So before we go into today's discussion,、um, if anyone in the audience has any questions, feel free to send me, and we'll try to answer all of them at the end.、Um, so first, Hasib, you have a really interesting、uh, LinkedIn profile, but、uh, maybe you can just first give us a very brief introduction of yourself. Yeah, I'd be happy to. So I'm a managing partner at Dragonfly Capital, which is a global crypto fund.、Uh, we invest into crypto. Globally, you know, different different、um, uh, things like L ones, L twos, DeFi,、uh, in in interoperability, which is of course the, the focus of、uh, what we're talking about today.、Uh, but we've made a lot of investments across the stack. So my background before I ever got into crypto, I actually I used to be a professional poker player a long time ago, back when I was sixteen years old until I turned twenty one.、Uh, I did that for five years as a professional. Eventually came into the software industry, became a software engineer. I was working at Airbnb when I first got into crypto.、Um, I worked at a couple crypto startups. I started my own startup. Then I worked at a fund called Metastable Capital, which is one of the oldest and one of the very earliest crypto funds that was founded back in 2014. So eight years ago now、uh, that Metastable was founded, and that's where I got my start as an investor. And then I came on board to Dragonfly, and I've been managing Dragonfly ever since. Right.、Uh, I have to say, your LinkedIn profile is probably like one of the most interesting I have I have ever read. So anyone, <laughs> you know, if you're interested, go find、uh, Hasib and、uh, read it yourself.、Uh, but so today, our question、uh, is about blockchain bridges and uh, uh, block blockchain globalization. So maybe the first question to tackle here is. What are blockchain bridges? So, for the audience, we have some links in the video description. Feel free to click and read on on them.、Uh, well, Hasib、uh, can give us uh, uh, his pers perspective on the topic. Cool. So, Nina, are you going to be controlling the slides? Is that how we're going to be doing this? Just so I yes, we will.、Uh, Got it. If I'm it. I'm、uh, if I'm late, feel free to tell me that I need to turn okay, to the next okay, page. Okay. 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 No problem. No problem. So.、Um, so.、Uh, I think before we start about bridges, I want to talk about this concept of foreign direct investment, which is a little—it's a little weird, it's a little bit random, but it's, a, I think, a good framework for thinking about why what we're talking about with respect to interoperability and bridges is so important. If we look at the real-world analogy to what happened with, you know, the same—the same, the same、um, uh, bridging and and crossing different borders between countries, you see why this concept is so important. So. Um, in in the land of foreign direct investment, go ahead and jump to the next slide.、Um, so, foreign direct investment is a very simple concept. Foreign direct investment is when、uh, a company invests, or a company or an investor invests into something in a different country. So, it can be a company, it can be some real estate, it can be whatever. And back in the olden days, foreign direct investment used to be a very negative concept. Meaning that most countries did not allow foreign direct investment. They didn't allow foreign investors to come into your country and to to purchase an interest in a company there, or to purchase an interest in some land or a factory or whatever. And over, especially in the '90s, in the '80s and the '90s, this really changed around the world. More and more countries started to become open to the concept of foreign direct investment, allowing foreign investors to invest into their domestic economy. Actually, today in the U.S., a huge amount of、uh, 
uh, U.S. capital ends up getting invested overseas, and a huge amount of overseas capital ends up getting invested in the U.S. So foreign direct investment is huge in the modern globalized economy. So if you look at this, um, this chart right here, this shows the percentage of foreign direct investment as a percentage of total GDP, meaning that how much of the world's total wealth is being invested into a different country than the country in which it is produced, which it, now it's, it's coming up to almost 40% which is a massive amount of flows that are moving around the world. So you can think of it, it used to be the countries, they make money and the money is invested inside its own economy. And so every country was kind of a closed ecosystem. But now, especially since the 80s and 90s, it's, it's completely changed. And you have, you know, you see it across states in the US, you see it across different jobs, uh, different, different job sectors that have foreign direct investment spurred uh, uh, companies or, or job creation. It's a huge part of the modern economy. Um, if you jump to the next slide, you can see that um, the things that globalization enables, globalization is one of the, one of the um, it's, it's very deeply connected to the concept of foreign direct investment because if you don't have foreign direct investment, it's very hard to have a globalized economy. It's very hard to have everybody being able to do business and commerce and trade with everybody else in the world. Globalization is one of the most valuable things that we've achieved in the last you know, 30, 40 years, it's gotten a lot of specialization, meaning that now there are certain uh, companies that only have to be good at one thing. They don't have to be good at everything, right? So, you know, here in the US, we don't have to be good at manufacturing because there are other countries that are good at manufacturing. We don't have to be good at textiles. There are other countries that are good at textiles. We can be good at the thing that we're good at. So it allows more specialization among countries. Um, it also uh, allows the creation of multinational corporations. So again, before the rise of foreign direct investment, it used to be that mostly there were big companies in one country and they weren't really able to cross the, the boundary of say, okay, this country, country or this company is also going to operate in Europe and also going to operate in Asia, also in, you know, uh, in, in, uh, in Japan or in, in Africa. Um, yeah, which, we, which is very like similar to the, to the blockchain space where you see like independent uh, blockchain ecosystem sort of isolated on their own. That's right. That's right. That's the, that's the current status of what you see in blockchain land. The other thing, of course, with a lot of globalization, foreign direct investment, you've got um, you've got so you've got a tremendous amount of growth that's taking place in the last uh, you know 20, 30 years as a result of foreign direct investment. Now, this chart on the right looks very similar to the chart on the left. And the chart on the right, if you go forward a slide, you'll see that chart on the right is the amount of TVL that grew in bridges. Now, this is before the bear market. Obviously, the, the numbers go down quite a bit because this article was written before the bear market. But um, the, what, what you see is the exact same shape, is that what's happening is that there's become suddenly more and more interest in bridging assets uh, and the rise of the equivalent of, quote, unquote, foreign direct investment in crypto and in DeFi. So jump over to the next slide. Um, the, the biggest bridges that you see today uh, where that's driving all these TVL are things like, so first, of course, there's uh, BNB chain, there's Polygon, there's Arbitrum, there's Avalanche, there's Neo, there's Optimism. What you see is that these bridges are connecting up these chains that otherwise don't have connections to each other. Before they had these bridges, they were basically islands, kind of the way that all these countries that weren't you know, trading with each other, they weren't exchanging financial flows with each other. Uh, they were just kind of isolated ecosystems. But now with the rise of bridges, all of these blockchains are interconnected through the through fair of the bridges. So if you go to the next slide, um, blockchain globalization brings the exact same thing that we saw from traditional economic globalization, right? So jump forward, next slide. So this concept of having specialization, multinationals, greater access and global liquidity. Well, in the blockchain land, what we have is in terms of, in, in, rather than specialization within a country, instead you have chain specific specialization. So, you know, a, a, a BNB chain doesn't need to do everything that Ethereum can do because some things can happen on Ethereum and then you can move your assets over to BNB chain to do this other thing, right? Same thing with Polygon, same thing with Solana. Solana doesn't need to be all things to all use cases. It can be good at the things it's good at and allow the other chains to be good at the things they're good at and they sort of, they can trade the same way that countries trade. Um, you now have the rise of multinational or multi-chain protocols. So for example, Aave is on like seven chains, right? It used to be Aave was just on Ethereum. But now Aave, kind of like McDonald's, right? McDonald's, they, they, you can have one franchise that goes into tons and tons of different countries because they've got a great product. They don't need to create a new McDonald's for 
Asia and a new McDonald's for Brazil and a new McDonald's for this other country. You can have one McDonald's and it expands and takes its management practices, its, its uh, robustness, its code, et cetera, into all these different countries. It's exactly what we're seeing also now in the blockchain. Now, if, with greater access, you also have access now in blockchain land to cross-chain experiences. So that means that as a user on any of these chains, you can now use products that otherwise wouldn't be available on your chain, right? Because yes. of the fact that you have access to cross-chain opportunities. Right. Ahead, you know? I, I noticed you're using globalization here instead of interoperability, which is, you know, we hear discussions about interoperability a lot more than globalization. So I'm, I'm, I'm assuming you're uh, referring to globaliza globalization as an overall con uh, concept that includes interoperability, like multi multinationals or multi-chain pr protocols and cross-chain experiences would fall into the interoperability umbrella, I feel. Exactly, exactly. I, I'm, I'm using blockchain globalization here more as, a, as an analogy to try to explain why I think interoperability I is, yeah. it's a broad concept, right? And, and what, what is interoperability going to do? The argument I'm roughly making is that I think it's going to do something very similar to what globalization did for you know, you know, the, the interaction and trade between countries. So yeah, that's a very good analogy. Yeah. Yeah. Exactly. If you just think interoperability is, okay, well, I can move chain, I can move assets from chain A to chain B. It's like, okay, well, what's the big deal, right? Like that's just kind of shuffling money around. But right. I think it enables a much more important concept that is going to increase the total economic value across all chains. The same way that, that uh, uh, foreign direct investment and globalization did that for countries. Yes. The same thing should happen on chain. Mm -hmm. That's a very, very good uh, analogy that helps people to understand. And also, you know, when you talk about multi-chain and cross-chain, uh, we all know that uh, Vitalik uh, uh, Buterin have made this argument that he's for uh, multi-chain future rather than cross-chain future. But this is a question we're going to discuss a little bit later. So now we can just keep moving on. Uh, maybe you can explain a little bit about how does blockchain work in the back end? So... How does blockchain work in the back end? You, mean, you want to explain like a, a, a very simple block, a blockchain in terms of you know, mutable ledger, yes. that kind of stuff? Yes. Okay, cool. Um, so a blockchain, so the first thing I should say is that blockchain itself is a little bit of a misnomer because a blockchain is a data structure. A blockchain is a, a bunch of blocks. You take a bunch of transactions or data, you compound them into blocks and you connect them using, um, using hash pointers, which is basically just like a cryptographic proof that these two blocks are connected. You do that over and over again, you have a blockchain. But a blockchain, a real blockchain, like, a, like Ethereum or BNB chain or Solana, um, a real blockchain is a lot more than just the data structure of a blockchain. It is, it is this data structure of a blockchain that is agreed upon through some kind of consensus mechanism uh, that also has some kind of legitimacy of the way that it is governed and controlled. So you need all those elements to really have a true you know, kind of decentralized public blockchain. Um, and each of these public blockchains, I mean, the thing that's really great about public blockchains is that they're all open. They're all open source. They're all, I mean, not they're all, but they're supposed to be. Most of them are open source. Um, and as a result, they can all talk to each other. So in, in normal software systems, right? Like let's say you, you have your bank and then you have your hospital, right? Your bank and your hospital, they're very closed source, meaning that they don't share with each other exactly how to interact with them. Right. If you want, if you want your bank to talk to your hospital, they both got to like sign a bunch of contracts and do some NDAs and do a bunch of nonsense in order for them to be able to interact uh, through their software systems. But blockchains, because blockchains are default open, anybody can use a blockchain. Anybody can run a blockchain. Anybody can interact with or read a, read the code of a blockchain. And as a result, it doesn't require permission for anybody to be able to connect two blockchains together. And that is the foundation for why blockchain interoperability is so powerful because of the fact that it's not, you don't have to go get permission, you don't have to go talk to Vitalik, you don't have to go talk to CZ, you don't have to talk to anybody if you want to go build a bridge or an interoperability layer between blockchains and get them to talk to each other. Great. So, so yeah, I think you're going to also talk about how, you know, blockchain ecosystem was like before, uh, you know, we had bridges that can provide this kind of very much needed functionality. And we have this slide with a horror story. So maybe you can explain exactly. from, exactly. from this exactly. part. Yeah. So I want to so walk through kind of what the state of blockchain interoperability or blockchain globalization, what it looks like today or what it has looked like, sorry, 
very recently. So let's let's play forward and I'll, I'll kind of walk everybody through this. So in, in the past, what you saw was that each individual blockchain was like a siloed city with no roads connecting any of the cities together, right? So you just had, you know, the, the Polygon, the Ethereum, the Solana, and they all live by themselves, right? So you have Ethereum, which is popular but expensive, right? And you have something like... Um, I don't know, Cardano, which is secure but slow. You have something that's like, uh, you know, Solana, which is fast but centralized. You have something like Zcash, which is private but empty, right? And they all kind of live off on their own and th th there's, no, there's no way to get from one to the other. So that, that, that's the old school experience. Um, so let's say you have some Ether and uh, next slide. And if you want to do stuff on other chains with your Ether, right? You have Ether, you want to go spend it. You want to go on BAB chain. You want to go on Polygon. You want to go on... Uh, near, you want to go do something. Um, if you go to the next slide, what you'll see is that today, or sorry, in the very recent past, you were stuck on Ethereum. You could really only use your ETH in one place. And that's basically the place where you got it, right? Because of the fact that all of these blockchains were siloed from each other. They were totally constrained. So it's almost as though, you know, you have your money in one bank and your bank can't move it to any other banks. You say, hey, I want to move my, I want to move to a new bank. And they're like, nope, you can't. Sorry, your money only exists at this bank. Um, that was the status quo until relatively recently. So if you move to the next slide, um, it's, it's as though you own wealth in one city, but your wealth can't move with you, right? Like I just described with this bank. Um, move forward. This sucks. <laughs> okay. Uh, next slide. Um, so now this was solved originally with bridges. Okay. So what is a bridge? So bridge is, it's kind of a misnomer because you think a bridge, you think, okay, it's like a little walkway that connects two things to each other. But I think that's the wrong way to think about bridges. If you think that's what a bridge is, you're going to come up with the wrong mental model for why bridge security is so important and it's so dangerous. Bridges are not like regular bridges. They're actually a lot more like banks. Okay. Now, what do I mean by that? You go to the next slide. I'll show you. So what is a bank? A bank is a building that takes in assets. It takes in cash, takes in gold, takes in whatever you put in the bank. And then it issues liabilities, meaning that it issues people claims on the things that are in the bank. So for example, let's say you come to the, my bank and you deposit some cash in my bank. What do I give you in return? Well, I, I tell you that you now have money in the bank. What, I, what you have is you have a bank deposit, right? That is a claim on the cash in the bank. But if the cash goes missing, when you come back to claim your money, your, the liabilities that I've given you are now not worth anything because I don't have the cash anymore, right? And so this is exactly what bridges do. Bridges take in tokens on one side. So let's say you're, you're bridging from Ethereum to Binance, uh, to, to BNB chain, okay? Um, so the, you take in tokens on one side. So let's say you move some Ether from Ethereum to BNB chain. You take in Ether on one side. So those are the assets that go into the bank. And then you issue wrapped Ether on BNB chain. Right? Because the two chains don't actually talk to each other. There's no connective tissue between the two chains. So on one side, I take in these assets. Imagine I just hold them in my own account. Right? If, we, if we ignore all the fanciness of bridges, imagine that I'm me, Haseeb, I'm just running a bridge. Okay? The way I would do it, I would take a bunch of money on this account, on, on the Ethereum side, and then on the BNB side, I would issue you, you know, you give me 300 ETH, I give you 300 wrapped ETH on the BNB side. Right? And when you want the wrapped ETH to go back into the ETH, you tell me, and then I'll, okay, I'll, I'll take these, I'll destroy them, and then I'll give you back the underlying ETH on the other side, right? It's exactly like a bank. And at any given time, you have to trust that I'm holding all the assets. And I still have everything that I said I did when I started bridging. Do you see any, I mean, I see the parallels very strongly, but do you see any differences between the bank analogy? And well, the, so of course the the, the yeah, so of course a, a real bank would do a lot more fancy stuff with <laughs> with the with the assets that it holds, right? So a bank might lend some of the assets that it has. It might um, you know uh, rehypothecate collateral and do a bunch of other fancy stuff. So of course it's more like a narrow bank or a full reserve bank. Um, so you can think of it as like a very very old school bank, the kind of bank that doesn't do fancy stuff, right? It's more like a stable coin kind of bank where you hold on to the assets but you don't do anything fancy with them. So it's more like Tether or like USDC than it is like Wells Fargo, for example. Mm -hmm. And of course, um, I mean, I'm not sure if we want to get into the part about, you know, banks are usually centralized. And ah, well, so the thing is, a lot of bridges are also centralized. <laughs> yes, so exactly. it's, it's uh, yeah. So the thing about a bank is that, of course, if uh, the people who are administering the bank go missing, then you're in trouble. 
So you need to find some way to decentralize. So one way or another, every single bridge, somehow, there are assets that are held in an account on the chain that is bridging assets over. And there are liabilities that are issued on the other chain. That's how every single bridge in existence works. Okay? That's how it has to work. So the question is, how are the assets held? Who's holding the assets and how are they holding them? That is the super you know, billion dollar question when it comes to understanding the security of a bridge. Yeah. So if you that, move to the next yeah. slide, what you'll see, of course, um, okay, go ahead and move, move forward. Um, most bridges today are state-sponsored bridges. Now, what do I mean by a state-sponsored bridge? What I mean is that, um, so let's say there's a bridge from Ethereum to Avalanche. Well, generally speaking, the dominant bridge on that chain is going to be the bridge that was chosen and generally speaking supported by the blockchain that they're bridging to. So the Avalanche bridge is a bridge that's actually maintained by the Avalanche team. The Avalanche team, they, they subsidize it. They kind of, it's almost like a nationalized bridge. In the same way you can think of in the early days of railroads, in the early days of canals, countries would very often nationalize these infrastructure because they were so important to the operation of the economy. They would say, look, we could give it, we could let a private investor run this, but it's so important that we get this thing right, that the country on the whole is going to take over responsibility because it's good for the overall economy, right? So the Panama Canal is a famous example right. where Panama was like, look, it's, we have to make sure the Panama Canal works. Otherwise, our whole economy is going to be in trouble. So mm -hmm. the entire country basically made an investment to make the Panama Canal robust. The same thing happens for a lot of the dominant bridges today in blockchains. Um, this may not be the case in five years, but today it is certainly the case. So the status quo that the L1s themselves fund the bridges, they maintain the bridges, they encourage asset inflows and user acquisition, which is why they're willing to do it, right? Because they want more users, they want more assets. And these bridges, how, you, you might ask the question, how do these bridges compete with each other? How do people decide which bridge I'm going to use? If there are two bridges moving from you know, Ethereum to Solana, let's say, which bridge would I decide to use? Well, the answer is that people generally use the bridge that's bigger. They generally use the bridge that has more assets. Why? The reason why is that they want to know that they are going to be bailed out if something goes wrong. So if the bridge gets hacked, right? It's the same thing. Well, how do you decide a bank? When you're deciding, okay, I want to put my money into a bank. Which bank like are you going to choose? Bank. The biggest the bank. You want bank. to choose the you want to choose the bank that you know the government has that bank's back. If something goes wrong, if there's a financial crisis, right? If you choose a little community bank, then who knows? They could go under, and then all your money is gone. But if you choose the biggest, baddest bank in the entire country, then you know the government is not going to let that bank go under, no matter what happens. And the same logic seems to be dictating how people are choosing which banks or which bridges they're going to choose when it comes to bridging into a layer one. So if you move forward to the next slide. Okay, how do we fix this? Let's, let's move forward. Um, so with bridges, keep going. Um, <laughs> just go, go forward all the way to the end of the diagram. Um, so <laughs> a little bit hard to talk through when I'm not clicking. Oh, oh go back. Oh, go sorry, back. going back. Um, okay. So with bridges, so you, you start with your ETH in self-custody, right? move it into the avalanche bridge or you know any bridge just using avalanche as an example you wrap it you take that wrapped ETH in your wallet and you start using that wrapped ETH in the avalanche ecosystem right and by this bridging experience it's very simple it's very intuitive right you move the assets into the bridge and on the other side you get your assets and you start interacting with them um, but there are downsides to this experience as we've seen with all bridges so we move forward bridges are vulnerable to hacks Almost everything in crypto is vulnerable to hacks at one degree or another, but bridges are particularly vulnerable for a couple reasons. One reason is that they hold a lot of money. They are big honeypots, meaning that they're big targets for hackers. And two, bridges are very technically complex because they're interacting with the connective tissue between two blockchains. And if one element of how these two blockchains work goes wrong, the whole thing could potentially break. So one of the most famous examples is a bridge called Wormhole, which connects up Solana, Terra, and Ethereum. And there was a hack, uh, I think in, this was in what was it, March, February. They lost $325 million uh, in a single hack. And this was covered by a group called Jump Capital, which is a big market maker in crypto. They paid back, uh, made, the, made the bridge whole to save everybody. Um, and it's kind of speculated that Jump Capital was kind of very closely associated with the Solana Foundation. 
because Solana was one of the big losers from this hack. And so the idea, and they were also big betters on Terra. This is before Terra collapsed, of course. Um, and so the perception was that Jump kind of stepped in almost as though they were the government because they owned so much Solana, they owned so much Terra, and they owned so much the bridge that it was in their interest to save everyone. And yeah. so people who were using Wormhole and they thought, okay, well, Wormhole's safe because it's so big. They were kind of right. Wormhole did get hacked, but all their money was safe because it ended up getting uh, reimbursed by, by Jump. Um, so this is a quasi-state-owned bridge, I guess. Exactly. This is, you can think of this as a quasi-state-owned bridge or a quasi-state actor. Now, there's another one that was even more famous, which was Axie Infinity's Ronin Bridge. Uh, this one lost $624 million total, absolutely the largest hack in crypto history. Um, and this one has been committed by the team to reimburse. And there was a, a broader fundraise that the Axe Infinity team did uh, in order to collect enough funds to be able to reimburse the users who lost funds in this, in this hack. So this was another case where centralized bridge, it was basically a multi-sig, and this multi-sig wallet got compromised and they lost tons of money. Um, there have been other hacks such as uh, the BSC bridge, Qubit. The Harmony bridge was hacked for $100 million just uh, a week ago, I think. And Nomad which was uh, actually just on Monday. Yeah. Uh, the Nomad Bridge was hacked for $180 million. And I this think the was, latest uh, figure is like $200 million. Is it? $200 million, really, yeah. So it, 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 it's, it's quite a... Th this one was particularly brutal. We don't have time to go into it necessarily, but yeah. um, Nomad Bridge connected up. Uh, uh, I think it was uh, Evmos, Moonbeam, and a couple of other smaller chains that they connected uh, with Ethereum. So... In total, we've now got well over a billion dollars that have been hacked from bridges. So bridges so far have been very clearly the one of the highest risk elements of crypto in terms of the, 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 the probability of getting hacked. So because users care about primarily, if this bridge gets hacked, will I be made whole? The dominant question for most bridges is, what is the strength of the balance sheet that's going to back this bridge? How much money will come to my rescue if... The bridge gets hacked. And so far, what we've seen is that the bridges that consumers have largely chose, namely you know, the Axie Infinity Bridge, Wormhole, um, in fact, they were made whole in those hacks. And so in some sense, users are smart in putting their money toward the places that have the strongest backers that are able to uh, protect them in, in the case of a shortfall. So let's move forward. So so I guess, you know, this is what users have been uh, doing so far. Like you say, they, they mm -hmm. care about, you know, whether they're going to be made whole after uh, a potential hack. Uh, but of, of course, there are some technical solutions as well. And I think, you know, particularly with the Nomad uh, hack, there is this almost, uh, I guess, you know, a kind of uh, um, rethinking about blockchain bridges overall. You know, do, do we actually relook at this topic from a completely different mindset? So that's something maybe uh, we can address later after, you, you know, after we finish this, uh, uh, this slides, which you, you have prepared about one of the solution could be generalized question messaging. So um, I'll let you explain what do you mean by that? Yeah, absolutely. Happy to go into it. So the, the so, so far, we've only really talked about bridges. And bridges, again, are a very simple concept. They, they take money on one chain, lock it, issue liabilities on the other chain, right? That's what a bridge is. But bridges are not the only thing that you need in order to create what we think of as foreign direct investment or blockchain globalization, right? Because if you think about it by analogy, what bridges do is they allow you to move assets from one country to another. So you can move your money from place A to place B. But that's it. Even when you bring your money in there, you can't do anything. You can't actually, you know, for example, if you want to start a multinational corporation, but all you can do is move your money to one place, but you can't actually start a company there. You can't actually interact with that country natively in the way that you can interact with your own country, right? Because you have no rights. You have no affordances with which to do that. Um, that is a problem for this overall vision of how blockchain globalization ought to work. In order to solve that, you need generalized cross-chain messaging. So um, let, let's move forward. I know that we're running low on time, so we can try to be a little bit uh, quicker. So uh, let's move forward to the next slide and, and I'll explain. Uh, so bridges alone only give you the free flow of capital. I, I just mentioned this, so let's move on. Um, the, uh, go ahead and, go ahead and uh, skip to the next slide. So what is generalized cross-chain messaging? Generalized cross-chain messaging is basically the idea that not only can I move assets from one chain to another, but in fact, I can call a contract that lives on another chain from this chain. 
meaning that I can basically do anything that I would want to do on the other chain. I'm, it's, it's almost as though that chain, I can reach through my own chain into that chain and do stuff, right? And so if you think about the internet, the internet is a good example of what it looks like to have total interoperability. Because on the internet, let's say I go to some website, right? I go to you know, Google and I go to Google and I uh, uh, see another web page. I can go click on that other web page, instantaneously jump to another web page. I don't need to think about it. There's no, you know, there's no like loading page of like, wait, you're leaving Google. Are you sure you want to leave Google to go this thing? I don't have to wait, you know, five minutes to like cross some boundary. It just instantaneously hops from Google to somewhere else, right? So Google has this ability to reach through and interact with any other um, any other domain, any other website, right? The internet is just, okay, it's all IPs. I don't care where you live. Um, the same thing will someday be true for blockchains. But in order for that to be true, you need this concept. You need generalized cross-chain messaging that allows any chain to interact with any other chain as though it's all one big empire. So let's move on to the next slide. Um, see here? Uh, cool. So we're, we're at an inflection point today in that with true cross-chain interoperability, you're going to enable much more than just bridging. It's going to enable you to really create cross-chain applications that can interact with each other, that can call contracts on other chains. You can get a true, um, you know, what, what, what you envision in a world that is truly blockchain globalized is that at, at some level, you won't even need to know what chain you are quote unquote on. If you're interacting in a cross-chain world today, right, you probably have some idea that, okay, I have some assets on Ethereum, I have some assets on BNB chain, I have some assets on Solana. And you have to know, do I have enough assets here to pay fees? Where's my USDC? Is it over here? Is it over there? Et cetera, right? But in a world where blockchains are truly globalized, you will just have assets. And you won't care what chain it's on. You won't even need to know what chain it's on, right? Now, applications will live on one chain or another, the same way that when you interact with the internet, obviously the, the websites on the internet live on some server that lives somewhere. But as a user, you kind of don't need to care. Sure, you can go look if you really care, but you don't need to care uh, if when I interact with this server, it's in, you know, this server is in Malaysia, this server is in, you know, Amazon uh, cloud, and this server is over here. Your browser just figures it all out for you. It used to be the case that all the stuff was much more clear, right? If you're interacting with a server that's across the world, it takes, you know, it takes, you know, 300 milliseconds round trip, and there's all this back and forth, and there's all this craziness. But today, the internet abstracts all of that away from you. The same thing will come true in a world of blockchain globalization. And that is what's going to eventually deliver us to the experience of having a truly global Web3, where as a user, you have assets, you interact with applications, but the chains themselves are abstracted from you. They're just purely infrastructure that hosts the applications and hosts the assets that you're going to be interacting with. That is the vision that I think eventually is going to arrive for public blockchains. But I mean, we have seen some projects trying to uh, do what you know what you described exactly, which is a question, a generalized question messaging. Um, so, but it, it seems like uh, we run into you know similar sets of security issues, and we haven't really seen you know much success success perhaps in this uh, in this field. So, so what do you see as the challenges for? Uh, for these type of protocols to be uh, really, you know, successful? It's a good question. So first, for, for true cross-chain message passing, generalized message passing, um, they're all fairly new. This hasn't existed for a very long time. So if you look at, for example, uh, Layer Zero, Layer Zero has, has only been operational for about, what is it, three months, something like that. Um, and it's probably the first really kind of fully robust generalized cross-chain message passing system. And they still are you know, kind of not fully operational in most of their features. So for one, they don't have uh, decentralized Oracle. They don't have decentralized relayers. Um, so it's, it's still quite a centralized system. It's still very early for, for Layer Zero to be able to do this. Um, another project that's, that's up and coming is one called Axelar. That's one of our, you know, full disclosure, it's one of our portfolio companies. Um, Axelar is, is also building this, but with a decentralized validator system that is, is basically going to kind of run this such that the validators themselves control the deposits on all the different chains and you're not uh, delegating it to third parties effectively. So the reality is that look, cross-chain master passing is a lot safer than cross-chain bridging because cross-chain bridging, like we said, is like basically running a bank. So if you have a bank, then you're going to have a lot of you know bank robbers who are going to show up trying to see if they can break the safe. 
Um, but cross-chain message passing doesn't have the same uh, liability issue because of the fact that these are one-time messages that are moving from chain to chain. So now there's always a risk in everything in crypto that that things go wrong. And and what you see, for example, you, you asked earlier, or somebody was asking earlier about Nomad. Um, so the Nomad hack is a good example of, of a kind of hack that really has not so much to do with interoperability per se, because the Nomad hack was basically a smart contract mistake. Yeah. The, the security model of Nomad is it's an optimistic bridge, meaning that um, it functions on fraud proofs. If somebody is cheating, trying to withdraw something, then anybody else can submit a proof to prove that they cheated. So it should be that in a design like this, if a design is working correctly, that the bridge should actually remain secure. But the design did not work correctly. I mean, there was a bug in the implementation of the design. And for anything in crypto, it doesn't matter what it is, if there's a bug in the implementation, theoretically, if the implementation is correct, the thing may be secure. But if the implementation is incorrect, then there's nothing in crypto that would be secure, right? Even a multi-sig wallet, if it has an incorrect implementation, as happened you know, back in 2016, or sorry, uh, 20, 2018, with um, the Parity wallet, um, if you have a multi-sig wallet that has a bug in it, then even a multi-sig wallet, something as simple as a multi-sig wallet can also break. So there is nothing in crypto besides just experience and having lots and lots of reps, lots of time underneath your belt that's going to prove something secure. Almost certainly there will be more bridge hacks because of the fact that one, they're big honeypots, there's so much money at stake. And two, because bridges are complicated. Some of the hardest things that we have tried to build in crypto is cross-chain. Uh, and so no doubt there will be other failures and other bugs that are going to take down things in the, in the sector of bridges. But in the long run, I do think that bridges are extremely important. So, so do you see like, uh, you know, this constant hacks, do you see this as, you know, as part of the uh, experience or part of lesson learning yeah. process that, that we have to go through? Uh, the implementation risks you mentioned, is, is there a way, you know, we can mitigate that? I, I think there are things that people can do to, implement, uh, to, to, to mitigate some of the implementation risks, right? So for, for example, um, there are things you can do around gates and basically say, look, if the, if the bridge is draining too quickly, something is probably wrong and we need to throttle the, uh, the bridge and make sure that there's some manual override when something like this happens. Of course, a lot of the, some of this, the, the difficulty with anything that you're engineering in crypto is that there's always this countervailing force People want the, the thing to be very safe, but they also want it to be very decentralized. And this is going to be kind of, you know, th there's a tension between these two things, right? Like if it's decentralized, that means no one controls it. If no one controls it, how can someone stop it when they think something is fishy? Who's going to decide that it's fishy? Um, so I think there will be de facto, more of these bridges will have these kind of natural fail safes, such that when it looks like there's too much money draining too quickly, everybody presses pause or there's a way for token holders to press pause on the bridge and prevent any further withdrawals until things get figured out. Um, but you know, in the long run, I do think there are going to be a lot of hacks and a lot of errors in the early days. Now, remember, the same thing happened to DeFi. In the early days of DeFi, there were tons of hacks. There were tons of failures. And over time, the system got more robust and it got everything got safer. I think we'll see the same thing happen in bridges, is that in the early days, look, these things are brand new almost certainly there are going to be more failures. Same thing happened with centralized exchanges. Right? If you remember back in the early days, there was Mt. Gox, there was CoinCheck, there was uh, you know, all these exchanges that were getting hacked for tons and tons of money. Um, and eventually you see consolidation. Is that you know, companies like Binance that end up being very, very strong and very secure become more and more robust and more proven over time. People learn which ones to trust and which ones are less safe. That will happen as well in the land of bridges, but it'll take time. Mm -hmm. you, you touched on this idea briefly, which is a very popular uh, concept uh, called the interoperability trilemma. Uh, so basically says, you know, protocols can only have two of the following three properties, uh, trustlessness, uh, extensibility and general generalizability. Uh, do you do you agree to this kind of um, uh, statement? And uh, do you think what's a solution here? So I. Uh I somewhat agree with this concept, but I think it is, it's a little bit overblown. Um, I do think that the, you know, I think solutions like uh, Axelar, like uh, uh, Layer Zero, like Synapse, they, they, they can really address some of this trilemma and make it more tractable. Um, the reality is that this early in the life cycle of a technology, it's, it's very hard to be able to make super strong claims about what it can and can't do. And so I think really for most things in crypto, it's a matter of 
allowing the entrepreneurs and the builders to prove it out. So to be clear, you know, for people who are who are listening, generally speaking, I don't recommend that you, you know, take your kind of hard-earned money unless you're able to lose it into a bridge. We've seen that these things get hacked often. These things are unsafe. They're beta software. They've only been around for like a year or so. So if you cannot afford to lose it, don't put it in a bridge, period. But again, as this space matures, I think we're going to see more and more um, robustness around the solutions that persist in the same way that's happened in almost every other sector in crypto. Mm -hmm. uh, another, I guess, opinion, I sort of uh, want to have your feedback, which is um, this very famous um, a piece written by Vitalik Buterin, he mentioned the anti-network effect of cross-chain activity. So basically, mm -hmm. uh, he says, you know, while there is not much of it going on, it's pretty safe. But the more of it is happening, the more the risks go up. So he's talking about cross-chain bridges activities specifically mm -hmm. here. Um, yeah. Do you do you do you also you know what, what's your view on, on this opinion? So I think this is kind of true. I mean, I understand what he's saying. What he's saying is that, look, it's, 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 almost, like, um, it's almost like arguing that, okay, we have um, today, there are banks in every country in the world, right? Um, and what Vitalik might be arguing, if you take the analogy of countries, right? So like, okay, there, there are banks right now in almost every country in the world. Well, it's really kind of safer if we just keep all the banks in one country and everybody else uses the banks in that country because those banks are super robust, they're super safe, they're, they're very scalable, right? And everybody can just use those banks. Like, it's okay to have, you know, okay, we got a bank in China, we got a bank in Korea, we got a bank over here. But like, if we start getting banks in every country, it's going to be really unsafe, right? Like, because then some of those banks might fail and that'll be really bad. So now it's certainly true that banks in other countries fail a lot more often than banks in the US fail. But there are certain things that you just can't do in the world if you only have banks in the US. And so from the perspective, if you're like a big central planner and you're saying, look, what is the best way to avoid bank failures everywhere in the world? It's like, yes, the answer is put all the banks in the US and make sure the US backs all the banks, right? That will make banking more secure. But that is not the only function of banks. The only function of banks is not to make sure that nothing bad ever happens. It's also to make sure that there is enough economic vibrancy and there's enough creativity and there's enough gener uh, you know, generative activity. It's why we have banks, right? You want there to be banks in Malawi and in Burma and in Pakistan and in you know, Brazil and in all these different places, even if, yes, the banks sometimes go under. I so think I that is it's, net yeah. better. Trade-offs, always. Exactly. It's all trade-offs. It's all trade-offs. I mean, if okay. you think about it, before the concept of interoperability, what was the way in which people, what was the cross-chain bridge before cross-chain bridges existed? The uh, answer is swaps. very simple. Exchanges. Exchanges, exchanges were the cross-chain bridges, right? Now, if you think about it, like is the, the exchanges face the exact same issue that bridges face, which is that one, interaction with all these blockchains is hard. And if one of the blockchains breaks, like it totally messes up your business. Two, there's a lot of surface area risk. It's very easy to get hacked. Because every single one of your endpoints, every single blockchain that you're on, if one of them gets hacked, that's the money that, that you lose for the, for the overall exchange, right? And as a user, when you wanted to move your assets from one blockchain to another, if I want to take my Ether, but I want to go get out some Sol, what people, that, that was basically the way you bridged, right? Is, is by using an exchange. Um, so exchange has been dealing with this for a very, very long time. And now we're moving into the era where we have generalized on-chain, more robust versions of what the bridge, you know, what this, this very proto-bridging that um, exchanges used to do. Um, but the, the problems and the trade-offs have always been the same. Um, I, don't think they, I don't think they will change. And so you know, I think what Vitalik is saying, I understand his point, but I think it is a regressive view of how blockchains are inevitably going to evolve. Mm -hmm. Always interesting to hear different perspectives. So now we have some questions from the audience. Uh, one person asked, um, how does cross-chain messaging allows funds transfer without a bridge? So it's a, it's a good question. So cross-chain messaging is actually a superset of what you need in order to do um, cross-chain transfers. So what, what I mean by that is that if you want to bridge, 
you can bridge purely using a cross-chain messaging uh, protocol. So that is, it's, it's sort of like, uh, uh, what's an example? If, if I allow you, so if you think about what cross-chain messaging does, it, like the globalization analogy, is it allows you to not just move money, but to actually create companies and hire people and do things in a different country, right? As opposed to just moving money. That's, what, that's all you could do with, in the world of bridging. Um, but if I allow you to set up a company and hire people and do stuff in different countries, you can do that to go to that different country and create a bank. And boom, now you've got, then, you know, now you've got uh, 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 asset movement. So in, in that sense, like you can use cross-chain messaging to create a bridge. But you can also do it to do a lot of other stuff that a bridge alone cannot do. Yeah. And we have another question, which is crypto is publicly traded uh, currency. So why can't there be a barter system through uh, numbers, uh, through the numbers of crypto uh, cryptos? So clients get desired crypto in exchange of their crypto. So I guess we have things like that in existence already. Uh, there's different uh, options. You can you can do that. Right. That's right. That's right. So one of the most obvious things that people want in terms of cross-chain applications is a cross-chain DEX, uh, a decentralized exchange. So in that cross-chain DEX, you could certainly make it so that the crypto is tradable against any pair, right? So you could trade Bitcoin for ETH, you could trade ETH for Litecoin, you could trade ETH for Monero, you could trade ETH for BNB or whatever, right? Now, the reality, of course, is that liquidity has its own network effect. So for the most part, people want to trade the most liquid pair. They don't want to trade... You know, A for they don't want to trade A for F. They want to trade A for B and then B for F. Uh, so whatever is the most liquid path that the most trading volume is going through, that's what people want to trade into. So usually that means you trade, you know, Ether to USDC and then USDC to the thing you want, mm -hmm. something like that. Mm -hmm. And uh, and another very timely question, uh, which is, uh, uh, audience wants you to share your thoughts on the Sonana wallet fund drain. Yes. So that <laughs> not sure happened, if, you can, uh, if you want to talk about that or <laughs> no, no, I can I can speak to it. So um, it looks like I, I was actually following this pretty late last night. I was I was tweeting about it as it was taking place. So um, originally people were worried that it was something at the Solana layer. Now it turns out that's that's very clearly not the case um, because the, the there have only been about eight thousand wallets that have been impacted. It looks like it was very likely. Now again, this is speculation. So. This is still live. Nothing's been confirmed yet. But it looks like there was a mobile wallet called Slope. And uh, it seems that almost all of the users that have been impacted used the mobile app, or sorry, the mobile wallet Slope and imported their keys. It seems very likely that what happened was a supply chain attack, where basically one of the, the code libraries used in this mobile wallet had an infected dependency that uh, caused the, 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 the C phrase that was in that mobile wallet to be exfiltrated and sent to a third party um, uh, server. And that third-party server is now harvesting all of those uh, all those wallets and monetizing them. So they totally have stolen about $7 million, I believe, uh, uh, roughly over about 8,000 wallets. So it seems like it's isolated to slope. It's not like a, a broad uh, uh, problem with Solana. Instead, it was one wallet that um, had a bad dependency and basically the wallet themselves got hacked is, is the, the short version. Mm -hmm. So obviously, uh, you know, this, this, this um, Sonana wallet uh, drain is still going on. Um, I guess we'll see what happens next. And we have another question about any technical paper on generalized question messaging that you can recommend. Yes, I'd recommend reading the white papers for Axelar and Layer Zero. Those are probably the two most important white papers in generalized cross-chain messaging that you want to read. Okay, so if you great. just Google them... Axelar, A-X-E-L-A-R, and Layer Zero, L-A-Y-E-R-Z-E-R-O. Um, if you just Google them, you'll find the white papers pretty easily. Mm -hmm. Well, great. Thank you so much, Hasib. And I, I do have another last question I want to uh, have your view, uh, share, have you share your views on, which is, you know, we've been talking about blockchain uh, globalization. Uh, do you have a rough timeline of, you know, how long it's going to take for us to get to certain <laughs> phases of, uh, of that ultimate goal? It's, it's a good question. I think it'll probably take us at least a year before we get to the point where you're seeing cross-chain interactions um, becoming pretty seamless and, and feeling pretty robust. I think it'll probably take two years before things feel to be very safe relative to where they are today. 
Uh, I think things will still feel like beta software. They'll still feel pretty risky. Um, I would guess it's probably going to be four to five years until we start to get abstraction over wallets, meaning that you'll start to, 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 you'll start to have an experience such that you don't actually know or don't need to care if you don't want to care which asset uh, or which chain your assets are on. So for example, you could like pay fees on Solana, but you only have USCC on Ethereum. And instantaneously using some kind of cross-chain protocol, um, automatically somebody could take your USCC, sell it for ETH, use that to pay the transaction fee on the ETH side, move the USCC over to Solana, go into Solana, sell some of the USCC on Solana and use that to pay the transaction fees on the Solana side. Right? All of that happening seamlessly in a single transaction, that will happen probably, I'm, I'm going to guess, in like four to five years. That sounds really, really cool. So yes, so we'll it'll make everything a lot simpler for especially most retail users. Mm -hmm. uh, we have one last question, I, I think, before we end, maybe you want to talk about, uh, which is the question on the core differences between layer zero and XLR, even though both are trying to solve the same interoperability problem. Absolutely. Well, actually, what I would recommend is that um, you check out the blog post that this talk was based on. So the blog post is called Blockchain Interoperability Axelar and Blockchain Globalization, I think. You linked it in the in the um, stream, yes? Uh, we can share the link, no problem. Okay, yeah, yeah please, please share the link. If you, if you just look up Dragonfly Research, um, you can also find this article. In the article, I explain in, in more detail the differences between Layer Zero and Axelar. Um, it's probably it's probably difficult for me to explain verbally. It's it's easier if you just read uh, the description. It's just like a few paragraphs yeah, um, that, that kind of go over what the individual differences are. Well, great. Thank you so much, Hasib, for your time today. And as everyone can see, we have the slides with uh, Hasib's uh, Twitter handle. Go ahead and follow him. And thank you, everyone, so much for being here today with us uh, for the Binance Academy live webinar. And thank you, Hasib. And uh, Take care and hope, hopefully we can talk again sometime soon in the future. Thanks, Nina. It was my pleasure. Thanks for having uh, me. All right.